hi everyone welcome back to my channel everything educator related this is a continuation to part one of the video so this is part two if you haven't watched part one please go ahead and check out that video and then come back to this video okay so let's get into it okay so i really hope you guys figured it out but these are the answer when Cassie left the room, she closed the room door. First is when Cassie left the room, she slammed the room door. If you look closely, these are the two words you should be paying attention to. This word is used more positively than this word. If somebody just closes a room door, it just means they are coming out, they are closing it. But if they slam the room door, it invokes the feeling as if they are mad or they are angry. So based on how these two words are used in the in the um sentence, you can see where it is at. one is positive and one is negative. So the other one says the girl grabbed the book from her friend versus the girl took the book from her friend. Imagine you have a book in your hand. You are giving the book to your friend. If the friend took the book from you just normally versus she grabbed the book from you you would say wait a minute why would she grab the book from me like that is she upset with me like what is she being mean to me so clearly the word grab is in provokes a more negative feeling versus somebody taking the book from somebody so we're going to look at how connotation appear to be in a reading passage, right? So a connotations come connotation sorry connotations come in the form of figure figures of speech. So that is for example metaphors. So remember connotation is the feeling a word provokes. So the feeling the word provokes a connotation can come in the form of a figure of speech. I hope you remember your figures of speech. I'm going to go over it as well. But a metaphor is a figure of speech. Metaphor connotates meaning that go beyond their literal meaning. Right? For example, she is a roaring lion. Right? So I am comparing she to a roaring lion. Now, remember, this can provoke a feeling, right? So ask yourself, what feeling does this provoke, right? So if I'm saying somebody is a roaring lion, would that mean they are bold, they are fierce, they are strong, they are mighty? Think about it. If I say his heart is a cold iron, what feeling does that provoke? Am I saying he is heartless? He doesn't has, have any sympathy? So connotations can take the form of a metaphor. Connotation can also take the form of an irony and a satire. So this means the meaning of the word is opposite to the literal meaning. Remember, an irony is saying one thing and meaning another. A satire is using humor irony and exaggeration to criticize people's stupidity so people so in passages you can find that irony and satire also shows the author's feeling or expresses the feeling being provoked right so for example isn't it warm today so i'm saying that to you where outside it is very cold Clear, clearly I'm using irony. And this can provoke a feeling in you where you have the question, what are they trying to say? Isn't it cold outside? Why would they say it is warm today? Are they trying to be funny? So once again, connotations take the form of a metaphor. It, it takes the form of a irony and satire. So in other words, overall, connotation comes in the form of figure of speech as well. So I'm going to go over the figure of figurative language or figures of speech with you in case you do not remember. 
So a simile uses as or like to compare one object or idea with another, to suggest they are alike. So remember, simile uses as or like to compare one object or idea with another. So I'm comparing someone being busy with a bee because remember bees are busy always they're always looking for honey right so if i want to say if my boss is is a busy person i can say my boss is as busy as a bee right if i have a drink in my hand i can say this drink is as cold as ice so i'm comparing the drink to ice Life is like a dream, right? So I'm comparing life to a dream. Remember, dreams come to reality, right? Dreams can come to reality. I can say, oh my gosh, I'm dreaming of driving a Mercedes one day. So I'm comparing life like a dream, in which a dream can become reality. The other one is metaphor. Remember, we used metaphor to say she is a roaring lion, if you remember. So remember I told you a metaphor can be a connotation in a passage. So a metaphor states a fact or draw a verbal picture by the use of comparison. Whereas a simile say you are like something, right? So a metaphor is similar to, is similar to a simile only that it does not use as or like. So it is basically a simile without using as or like. We're still comparing something, but without the use of as or without the use of like. So I, a metaphor would be time is money. I'm literally saying that time is money, meaning that you cannot waste any time because time is money. Another example is you are what you eat. So I'm comparing you, what you eat. So basically I'm saying, if you eat, if you eat a big burger, you are going to feel like a big burger. If you eat vegetables, you're going to feel light, healthy, right? So that's basically what, the, what that means. You are comparing two things, but you are, comparing without using as or like. So I really hope you got the meaning of the simile and the metaphor. Person of personification on the other hand is a figure of speech in which human characteristics are given to an animal or object. So for example, my teddy bear gave me a hug. Remember, a teddy bear is not a person. So it, there's no way a teddy bear can give you a hug, but that's what personification does. It gives life's it gives human characters or gives life to an object or to an animal. So, for example, the tree, the tree danced in the wind. So we know that a tree cannot actually dance. What personification gives human characteristics to an object or an animal, right? Next one is alliteration. Alliteration is a repetition of the same initial letter, sound, or group of sounds in a series of words. So, for example, she sells, she sells shells by the seashore. What this means is the initial letter, which is, which is S, is repeated. So this is an alliteration. Other figurative language is onomatopoeia. Onomatopoeia is the use of a word to describe a natural sound. So, for example, boom, or whenever the drum makes that sound, or when something, a water drops on the floor, splash. That's onomatopoeia. That's, it's the actual sound. Or, ting, like when a bell rings, it's the actual sound. Um, hyperbole is exaggeration that is so dramatic that no one would believe the statement is true. So, for example, oh my gosh, I am so hungry. I feel like I could eat a horse. I'm being, I'm exaggerating, basically. So, I'm basically exaggerating there. So, the next one is idioms. 
So idioms is an expression that is peculiar to itself, either grammatically or in having a meaning that cannot be derived from the conjoined meaning of its elements. So for example, Fred is feeling under the weather. So that is an expression that is strange to itself, either grammatically or in a meaning that cannot be derived. So I hope you understand that one. The next one is cliques. Cliques is an expression. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I think it's cliques. But a clique is an expression that has been used so often that it becomes trite. So for example, many hands make light work. So that's a clique, cliques. Next, we're going to look at word choice and tone. Word choice and tone is extremely important because in the essay writing, you are going to have to be able to figure out how the author is using the words. So this go back to connotations, right? So is that word being portrayed negatively or positively? What is the author trying to say? So the word choice is very important because depending on the word the author use, you can know if the author is saying, is feeling negative about a topic or feeling positive, or is for a topic or against a topic, in other words. So I'm going to show you how word choice and tone comes into place. Now you might be wondering if tone is not verbal. The word choice allows you to figure out the author's tone or how the author is saying something. So let's read here. So the words an author uses in his or her essay can help the reader to identify the author's tone. So that's what I just said a while ago, right? So tone is the way the author feels towards the subject of their text. So in this case, tone is not verbal. It is author's feelings. Tone is an author's feelings towards the subject of their text. You might wonder, how am I going to know how the author feels about what they're writing? You will know based on the words they are using in their essays, right? Or in their stories. So you will know if the author is writing to persuade, to inform, or to entertain the reader. So an author usually writes for three purposes. They are either writing to persuade somebody, they're either writing to give you information or to inform you, or they're either writing to entertain you. So here's an example you can look into to understand tone. Have you ever been disrespected to some to, have you ever been disrespectful to someone and they told you to watch your tone? What they mean is your attitude, right? So it's the same for reading. The way an author speaks about a topic and the words they use, you can tell if the author agrees with a subject or if they disagree with that subject. So if author A used the words irre irrelevant, ridiculous to describe the school system versus an author who says brilliant, life-changing for youth, you would infer that author A, which is the one that used irrelevant and ridiculous, disagrees with the school system versus author B, who uses brilliant, life-changing for the use, he would, he would sound more as if he agrees with the school system. So that's what I'm trying to say. Word choice in an essay has a lot, um, has, has a lot to do with how the author feels about the subject or topic. You want to know how the author feels because this, these are questions they, they ask in the GKE reading exam. They are going to ask you how the author feels about something or how he feels about. So if the, for example, if the essay is about, um, uh, let me see, oil change. This is just an example. You're, I'm not, it's just an example. They're going to ask you, what is the tone of, of the author used in line four to five? So based on the word choices, you can 
find out how the author feels based on the topic oil change whatever he's trying to say in, in oil about oil change right so it's just an example i'm trying to show you so these are just examples of positive tones and negative tones we also have satirical or humor tones or sorrowful tones so for example if you're reading an essay and you see the word excited passionate vibrant confident amused etc etc you can the the essay has a positive tone versus a a essay that has sad concerned depressed apologetic gloomy that gives a more sorrowful or fearful or worry worry type tone right so that's the difference a negative tone would be like if they use the words condescending in the essay if they use the word desperate if they use the word arrogant disgusted you can know that the author has a negative feeling towards the topic he's um um writing in other words you can tell that the author has a negative feeling towards whatever subject is he is he wrote about in the essay right i hope i'm not confusing anybody i hope you're understanding what i'm saying so based on the words the author uses in his or her essay so the, the essays that you're going to read in the exam based on the types of word you can know if the author agrees or disagrees or if the author is passionate or if he has negative feeling towards whatever subject he's he's writing about in the essay he wrote about in the essay so words has a lot to do with it the word choice will let you know the would let you know the author's tone which is the author's feeling towards the subject he is writing about okay so next next are text structures you are going to know you are going to want to know the different text structures because they will ask you Sometimes they will have a question that asks you to tell what text structure is being used. So these are seven text structures, but I'm going to go over some the most important ones or the most common ones. So chronological text structure is information in the text or passage is arranged in order of time. So there are some passages like this where you will see time being mentioned. So this is more of a chronological order. So for non-fictional passages, which are fact-based, often contains dates, right? So remember, fact-based. Remember, an author's purpose can either be to persuade, inform, or entertain. So if they are using dates in their essays, that would more sound as if they're trying to inform me on something because they're using fact based information based so maybe the purpose of that essay would be to inform me on something right so back to what i was saying i'm just giving you a little tip right here so chronological so i'm going to give you an example the first education law for special education students was passed in 1974 called the education for all handicapped children act which was then changed in 1990 to be called the Individuals with Disability Education Act. Right then and there, you realize that I am using order of time. So I'm telling you that the first act which was passed in 1974, then I go on to tell you the other act that was passed in 1990. Clearly, I'm trying to inform you on the acts, special education laws or special education acts that were passed for special education children, right? So this is what chronological text structure is. It orders information in time spans. It's order of time. So that's how you can know the difference between a chronological text structure and another text structure. Chronological text structure has dates, often contain dates, and it's in the order of time. So on the other hand, Fiction passages or narratives such as stories and poems are organized chronologically but usually have no dates. So you have two types of chronological text structure. You have the one with dates and you have the one that does not have dates but they are still in order. So the story events in a chronological text structure that have no dates are told in order. 
So for example, Jody woke up at 6.30 a.m. for school. First, she brushed her teeth, took a bath, and got dressed. Next, she goes downstairs to eat breakfast that her mom cooked for her. After, she says goodbye to her mom and heads outside to catch the 7.15 a.m. bus to school. You can see here when the events are being mentioned in order. So chronological text structure is all about order of time. In other words, it's all about order. So chronological text structure can be told in order of time containing dates, or it can be told in order of time without dates. So either they tell you a year, so in the first example, 1974-1990, or they give you in an order using first, second, first, next, after. Basically words that are that contain order. So I really hope I explained that well. The other text structure is compare and contrast. So the passage is structured in a way similarities and differences of two things are explored, right? Remember, comparing meaning similarity, contrast means differences. So two subjects are being analyzed by either comparing them, contrasting them, or both. So in an, in the FTC exam, this may come in, in the case of two paragraphs. I'm sorry, two passages. Sometimes you get, sometimes in the FTC exam, they give you passage one and passage two. And sometimes they're comparing and contrasting two different um, stories. But they have a comparison in it. So they, are, they have similar stuff in it. So you will have to know how to figure that out. So that's why I'm explaining it to you right now. So for example, the federal system divides powers between the national and state governments. Both can borrow money, enforce laws, and establish courts. So here, they're saying that the federal system divides power between the national and state government, but both the national and state government can borrow money, enforce laws, and establish courts. But... Only the national government can declare war and establish post offices. So we got our similarities, which is borrow money, enforce laws, establish course, and we got our difference. The national government can declare war, but the state government cannot. The national government can establish post office, but the state government cannot. So that's what a compare and contrast text structure looks like. And sometimes you can figure this out by the type of words that is used. So for example, while, yet, but, like what was used in the example, rather, most, same, either, as well as, like, unlike, as opposed to. So those are words that can help you to figure out if a passage is a comparison and contrast passage. So for more information, you can check out this website. So it gives a big example here where this is clearly a compare and contrast text structure. So you, in your free time, you can go ahead and read it so you can understand what a compare and contrast text structure might look like. I might put the link in this description so that you can go ahead and find it. So the next text structure is problem or solution. You have to know what problem and solution is. So a problem is clearly something that is an issue. And a solution is clearly how we're going to solve that issue, right? So this takes place in an essay. Passage or text that states a prog problem and a solution is suggested. So to avoid problems encountered during whale watching, you should learn about their paths and the habits. To avoid problems encountered during whale watching, the observers can do 
things such as watch from a distance, stay parallel to them, and respect their space. The first one here that says to avoid problems encountered during whale watching, you should learn about their paths and habits. Clearly, the problem is he is mentioning that to avoid problems during whale watching. The solution to this is to learn about the whale's paths and habits. The other one says to avoid problems encountered during whale watching. The solution was, would be to watch from a distance, stay parallel to the whales, and respect the whale's space. So this is a problem and solution. So a problem is listed and then a solution is given. So these are words that you can find in a problem and solution essay. So you can find the word propose, conclude, a solution, the reason for, the problem, or question. So this is an example of a problem solution essay. I'm going to give you a few minutes to read, and then I'm going to read. So, consumption of processed and convenience foods and or dependence on the car have led to an increase in obesity and reduction in the fitness level of the adult population. In some countries, especially industrialized ones, the number of obese people can amount to one third of the population. This is significant as obesity and poor fitness lead to a decrease in life expectancy, and it is therefore important for individuals and governments to work together to tackle the issue and improve citizens' diet and fitness. So basically, they are talking about the consumption of processed and convenient foods and or dependence on car have led to an increase in obesity and reduction in fitness level. So clearly the problem is obesity, right? So if you read this on your own, you would see they go into more details with the problems. So now we're going to look for the solution. Changes by individuals to their diet and their physical activity can increase life expectancy. Right? By preparing by people preparing their food, by people consuming fruits and vegetables, people could ensure that their diets are healthier and more balanced. In order to improve fitness levels, people could choose to walk or cycle to work or to shops rather than taking the car. So remember, the problem was that is obesity is an increase in obesity and reduction in fitness level. And here they are telling us a solution to that. So they're telling us that people can consume fruits and vegetables. And for the fitness level, they're, can, they're telling us that people can choose to walk or cycle to work. So this is an example of a problem solution essay. You can read it on your own time so that, you know, you can have an idea of what a problem solution essay looks like. So the next text structure is cause or effect. A cause is... Okay, so what caused something to happen and what's the effect of that something happening? So a passage or text that explains the reason why something happened or what happened as a result of something happening. So that's the cause. So a cause is something that produces an event or condition and an effect is what results from that event or condition, right? So once again, for example, let's use the obesity. So eating junk food costs weight gain. So eating junk food costs weight gain. The effects of weight gain is obesity. So you have the cost right there, which is eating junk food, and the effect is weight gain, which result in obesity so in cause and effect text structure you the words that are used in those essays are because since if then 
due to, as a result of, for this reason, on account of, consequently. So this is a good cause and effect essay that you can go ahead and read on your own time. If you want to know what a cause and effect essay looks like, this is it. I will put the link in the description so you can find it on your own. So here is one that I will be going over with you as well. So remember, this is a like a um, essay, right? So you have your introduction to the conclusion, right? So this is a whole essay for you. So introduction. And remember, this is how the essay is structured. So a lot of people make a big deal as if the exam is scary, but I want you to view the exam as a just a regular essay, literally, as if you're doing essay writing. It's literally like that. It has an introduction, thesis statement, your three, the body, and the conclusion. That's literally what you're reading. So in when you go into the exam, you do not need to be nervous because it's basically an essay that you're reading that somebody else wrote. You just have to pick out the important details that you're supposed to know. Okay, so the number of children reported to suffer from bullying rises every year. Teachers and parents are struggling to find a resol resolution for this issue. But what if the key to stopping this abusive behavior is understanding the causes? It appears that bullying begins with personal desires or family issues and leads to the increasing number of kids who suffer from it. So, sometimes a kid lacks attention by their parents or peers, which causes them to seek attention in other peer, um, places. It results in aggressive behaviors towards other kids since supervisors cannot ignore such action and they attend to the violators. Bullies finally achieve their goal by being noticed, which encourages them to continue their faulty behavior. So, the cause would be a child lacks attention from their parent or peers so this results in the in the child seeking attention in other places and it results in aggressive behaviors towards other kids since supervisors cannot ignore such action right so we have our cause right here and the effect which is aggressive behavior towards kids so another reason for such aggressive behavior may result from desire to be invincible. So they want to seem as if they are, nothing cannot happen to them, in other words. Maybe a bully was humiliated or embarrassed once, and they never wanted to experience it again. Thus, they do everything possible to stay the strongest one and be in charge. Not only does it protect them, but it gives them a feeling of superiority, which sometimes becomes addictive. So the cause of this would be they want to be invisible, invincible. So the cause of them bullying is because they want to seem invin invincible because maybe they were once humiliated or embarrassed. So this effect of this is they try to do everything as possible to stay the strongest one and be in charge, right? So that's another cause and effect. So in addition, bullies might protect their family issues on project, sorry, their family issues onto others. For instance, if a child feels negative emotions from physical or emotional abuse at home, they may choose, they may keep those emotions inside. However, negative emotions cannot stay inside forever, and as a consequence, they begin projecting these emotions onto their peers later. So I'm really Hoping you're paying attention to the words, for instance, as a consequence. So this is shows an effect right here. So the cause, bullies might project their family issues onto others. For instance, if a child feels negative. So the cause would be feeling negative emotions from physical or emotional abuse at home. Right? So because of these emotions, it results in them <clears throat> exploding those emotions on others. 
So that's why they have, as a consequence, they begin projecting those emotions on others. Even in the other ones, pay attention to the words so you can know um, how to identify the cause and effect, which causes. So this is what causes them to seek attention. So them having a lack of attention causes them to seek action. And this results in, so it results, so that's another word, it results, which is the effect in aggressive behavior. So I want you to pay attention. So that's how you can know when it's a cause and effect essay, because you see the type of words that are being used. You, you see because, you see consequently, you see as a result, um, you see cause. So you have to really pay good attention. So those words that are being used. Okay. So wait, before I move on, all causes mentioned above lead to increasing number of bullies. Whatever the reason is, the primary effect is the suffering of the innocent kids who become bullies. Bullies have different reasons for acting like that, but sometimes it is no more than an unconscious re reaction to the environment, just like what happens with family issues. Conclusion, there are a number of reasons for such widespread phenomenon as bullying, including attention seeking, a desire to be superior, and family issues. Knowing the causes may help schools and families to develop and implement preventative measures. Therefore, instead of struggling with the con consequences of bullies, aggressive behaviors, teachers and parents may prevent that altogether. So the causes are what we see is attention seeking, desire to be superior, and family issues, which um, bottle up all those negative feelings and the effect of those is bullying. The ultimate effect is bullying. So the next text structure is description. It describes a topic or detail by listing characteristics, features, attributes, and example. So for example, characteristics for instance, such as including to illustrate are some words that you can see to allow you to know if it's a description text structure. So remember, a description describes something. It breaks down and tell you about that thing, right? So for example, Russia is one of the world's largest countries in the area. It is nearly 6.6 .6 million square miles and is spread across two continents with the majority of the population living west of the Urals where the climate is mild. So it's describing Russia. It's telling us that it's one of the world's largest con countries. It's telling us that it's nearly 6.6 .6 million square miles. Um, it tells us that it spreads across two continents with the majority of population living in the west. So it is describing Russia, in other words. So next, we're going to talk about first hand versus second hand account. So you want to know the difference between these because sometimes they might ask you questions um, like this in the essay. So you want to know that a first hand account is written by someone who experienced the event. So this may include opinions such as diaries, letters. So it is the person that actually experienced whatever it is. So they use I and we, because remember, they actually experienced it. A second and account is written by someone with knowledge of the event, but that person did not experience it. So for example, textbooks, newspapers, and you'll see they will use he, she, you, they. So that's the difference between a first and a first and account, the person experienced it. A second account, the person did not experience it. They basically um, 
is written by some they basically have a knowledge of the event but they did not experience it they only had a knowledge of it so that's for the second hand so if you read here this would be a first hand account over here it says july 18th 1871 we were in the wyoming territory if you realize they use the word were because they're actually experiencing it now and it has been a few days since we had good water i am starting to worry so you can see there he's using i because he's actually experiencing it it's been at least a week since any of us saw a tree but the buffalo chips remain plentiful at least the darn things burn out so this is clearly a first hand account because the person that wrote this is actually experiencing whatever is happening here they are most they are more emotional about what is happening and you it's only one perspective that is taking place so the clues is the were i'm us shows that you know that person is the one that is experiencing whatever is happening versus the second account, um account second hand account remember the second hand account this person did not experience it but they have a knowledge of it right so let's read that one the oregon trail didn't have many trees the pioneers used buffalo chips dried buffalo dung as fuel for their fires if you realize they are telling us they're giving us knowledge and they use the word there if that person used the word i or were like the first one you could say they, it's a first hand but it's not because they use there so somebody is giving us knowledge of this they were not there they're just giving us knowledge in fact some children played games without buffalo chips they tossed them around like frisbees another word they used they so that is to show this is a second hand account evidence so you want to know how to find evidence in your reading so sometimes they will ask you what evidence does the pas does the passage mention to support whatever 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 so remember the evidence is the proof so it is anything used to prove an idea that is true real or correct this takes place as facts and statistics which comes from re reliable sources it can be a testimony such as a quote or a paraphrasing that provides support on a thesis or a position or it can be an anecdote which a which is a short story so for example you know you're going to have your main idea and the author uses evidence or information to back up the main idea or what they are trying to say so that's basically the evidence So well, this website basically shows you the types of evidences that are used. So it goes over the six types of evidence and breaks it down so you can understand. So this is the other one. Remember, I mentioned author's purpose in the beginning, which is the author's purpose can be to inform, persuade, or entertain. And there's another one, which is describe. And I'm going to speak to you about point of view and tone. So in, whenever you're in the exam, after you read a passage, you should ask yourself, why did the author write this? Why? Why did he take the time out to write this, this um, essay? Next, you're going to ask yourself, what was the author saying? What is the author trying to tell me as the reader? What is he trying to tell me? In other words, what is the author saying? And then you're going to ask yourself, how did the author say it? So that's the feelings of the author. So the author's purpose is why did the author write this? Is he trying to inform me? Is he trying to persuade me? Is he trying to describe something to me? Is he trying to entertain me? Then you're going to ask yourself once again, what was the author saying? What is his point of view on it? What was he saying? 
And last, they're going to ask yourself, how did he say it? That's, that would be the tone, the author's feelings. In other words, the author's feelings. How did he say? How did he say what he was saying? So by knowing the tone, you're trying to, you know how he's feeling towards the subject he's writing about. So first, we're going to go over the purpose, the author's purpose. Once again, that would be, why did the author write this? What is his purpose? What is he trying to do? So by asking yourself why the author wrote the passage, you are figuring out what the purpose of the passage is. This will help you to understand what the passage is saying because you understand the author's purpose. The author's purpose can be to inform the reader, that is to explain something, to clarify something, to share information, or to elaborate on a topic. So, for example, textbooks, journal articles, and newspapers are to inform readers. So, that's the purpose. So, if, if you're reading a textbook on, for example, Amobi, Amob, Amobias, Amobia, I think that's like a, I don't know, it's a science term. If you're reading a passage on that, the author's purpose would be to inform you on Amobia right? Same for newspaper. If there is a pandemic, right? The newspaper would be writing or informing you about that pandemic. So that's the first purpose of a author. The author's purpose can be to inform the reader. The next purpose of a author can be to persuade the reader. This is when the author is trying to convince you on something. It means to convince people to change their opinion, point of view on a topic or a behavior or their behavior. So example, passages about controversial topics, political speeches, book reviews are examples of how an author, of how the author's purpose would be to persuade. The next is to entertain readers. By entertaining this, mostly comes in the form of telling a story, and the author uses literary devices, figurative language, and plot. So, for example, in poems and novels, this is how the reader, the purpose of the reader is to entertain. Sorry, the purpose of the author is to entertain the reader. And then lastly, the, la the purpose of an author is to describe. So, basically, the author is describing something in more detail. So this is found in short stories and novels where the author is trying to paint a picture in the reader's imagination. So once again, the author's purpose can either be to inform the reader, to persuade the reader, to entertain the reader, or describe something to the reader. So that's good. That's a good um, that's a good example. So this is a website I found on author's purpose. I found it very helpful as it has a passage right here. And then these are questions. So it has, I'm not sure how many passages, like five passages. So I'm going to do one with you. And on your own, you can go ahead and visit the website. So we're looking at author's purpose. And the name of this passage is Social Security. So, until the early 1900s, Americans were not extremely concerned about their future as they became older. So basically they're saying it is the early 1900s is when Americans became concerned about their future, right? So the major source of economic security was farming and the extended family cared for the elderly. So that was the major economic security, farming, and then extended family were the ones who cared for elderly. However, the Industrial Revolution brought an end to this tradition. So Industrial Re Re Revolution changed this, in which farming gave way to a more progressive means of earning a living and family ties became looser, right? So as a result of this, family was not always available to take care of the older generation. 
So the Great Depression of 1930s exacerbated these economic security rules. So the Great Depression they're seeing exacerbated these economic security rules. So in 1935, Congress, under direction of President Franklin D. Roosevelt, signed into law the Social Security Act. This act created a program intended to provide continuing income for retired workers 65 years old, or at least that age, partially through the collection of funds from Americans in the workforce. Much organization was required to get the program underway, but the first monthly Social Security checks were issued in 1940. Over the years, the Social Security program has metamorphosed has metamorphosed into benefits not only for workers but also for disabled and for survivors of beneficiaries as well as medical insurance benefits in the form of Medicare. So it's asking here, the author most likely mentions the depression too. So remember, at first, the major source of economic security was farming, right? And extending family to care of elderly. Then they use the word however, meaning what's starting to happen now is the industrial revolution brought an end to this tradition where farming was economic security and extended family was taking care of the elderly. Industrial revolution brought an end to that. So they're saying farming gave way to a more progressive means of earning a living. And so family ties became looser. As a result, the family was not always available to take care of the older generation. Then it goes to say the Great Depression exacerbated these economic security rules. So in 1935, he, saw, he signed into law the Social Security Act. So this program was intended to continue income for retired workers, right? So now, instead of the family members taking care of them, the Social Security Act would provide income for retired workers, partially through the collection of funds from Americans in the workforce. Okay. So benefits not only for workers, but also disabled and survivors, blah, blah, blah. So what this question is asking, the author mentions, why did he mention? Why did he mention depression? All along, he was talking about what is happening. And then he mentioned that the Great Depression exacerbated the economic security rules. So I wonder if this would mean worsen. So comment down below what you think that would mean. So exacerbated means to make worse. So how it is used in this sentence, it makes it seems as if it is saying the Great Depression exacerbated, made worse the economy, economic security. So no more was farming a major source of economic security. So it's saying the author mentions this though, identified the primary purpose for social security. Hmm. If the Great Depression made that worse, do you think he mentioned that to identify the purpose of social security? I don't think so. Did he say that to criticize FDR's adoption of a program that would run out of money? Mm, this passage is not really about criticizing. If it was criticizing, I'm pretty sure he would go into more details about um, FDR, or in other words, Franklin D. Roosevelt. I'm pretty sure he would come up with more um, things saying something bad about Franklin Roosevelt, right? So I don't think it's to criticize him. 
The other one, contrast, mean differ. The effectiveness of the social security program with that of family care. I don't think so, because these are two different stuff. How, is, how are they contrasting the effectiveness of these? No, they talked about it separately. So they, at the end of here, they told us the effectiveness of the social security program. Um, it says social security program has metamorphosed into benefits, right? That's what they said. Um, so I don't think they're contrasting it with family care. They were just telling us that the family um, was not able to take care of the older generation. So I don't think they're contrasting anything here. And then the other one is list another factor that contributed to the need for a social security program. So I think this is the answer because it added to what they were saying. So it this is an that mentioning that was them listing another factor that contributed the need for social security, right? Because remember, they said farming gave way to more progressive means of earning, and as a result of that, the family was not able to take care of the older generation. Then they go on to say the Greater Depression of the 1930s is exacerbated. So in addition to farming giving more to progressive means of earning and living, and in addition to the family was not always able to take care of older generation, you find that the Great Depression made matters worse. So they were listing another factor that contributed to the need of the social security. Program. So let's see if that's correct. On that same page, you can find the answers at the top. If you go to here, PDF handouts for teachers, this is practice one that we just did that was one of the passage or paragraphs or whatever you'd like to call it we're going to click on answers to it so we can see the answer so we did social security so the answer is list another factor that contributed to the need for the social security program so that is the answer this is a pretty good practice for you so you can go to this website i am going to link it down below as well the author description of the temperature primarily serves to. So these are questions that is comes in the form of author's purpose. Next, we're going to do author's point of view. Is the author for or against the topic? So to figure out the author's point of view or to figure out if the author is for or against a topic, you have to use context clues. So you have to ask yourself, is there bias in whatever the author is saying? Is there a bias? Right? So let's look at two of these sentences. Medicare should pay for standard prescription versus Medicare should pay for prescriptions. Clearly, there's a bias here. Use the word standard instead of just saying Medicare should pay for prescription. There's a bias here. Because look at the word the author chose to use. When someone is biased, they tend to include their opinion instead of being neutral. So here he's saying the prescription is standard. Versus if it was neutral, meaning Medicare should pay for prescription, it wouldn't be biased. But because he's including his opinion, he said standard prescription. He described what the prescription was to him. So you can tell the author's point of view based on the tone he or she uses, right? So whenever you're reading your essay, you're going to look for the tone. So the tone, once again, is the author's feeling towards the topic of the passage. So remember, I introduced denotation and connotation, right? And we focused more on connotation, where there can be negative connotations and positive connotations. So you can use, based on how the author uses a word, you can tell if the author's feelings towards whatever the subject of the essay is. So here's an example. We received your request for a refund for your recent purchase of a desktop computer. Please accept our sincere apologies that the product did not function as you'd like. We will process your refund in one to two weeks. In the meantime, please let us know if you have any concern. What would be the tone of the passage? Remember, the tone is the author's feeling. Look at the word choices the author used. He uses the word sincere apology. 
any other concern? So he's basically apologizing. Please accept our sincere apology. Clearly, this pass the tone of this passage is ap apologetic. Sammy sat on the old lump lumpy bed crying. She could tell all her tears. She could let all her tears out here in her aunt's quiet one-bedroom studio. The familiar countenance and walls brought back memories. Puddle, her aunt's eighth fish, seemed to stare sympathetically at Sam through the fishbowl, sitting on her aunt's nightstand. The smell of her aunt's strawberry candles comfort her aching heart. So let's look at the words. What is the author's tone? The author's tone gives as if he's sorry for, for Sammy. That's what it gives to me. So see, sad, heartbroken, comforting. This is just basically a practice. So this has five questions. As 15-year-old Perry shuffled into my office. With if you're interested in watching me complete this worksheet, please go ahead and click the next video. Yes, guys. So I will put the links in the description. Our video has come to an end. I know it was a long one. I will try to do competency three soon. But in the meantime, please go ahead and subscribe to my channel if you want to see more videos like this. Thank you for everyone who has already subscribed. I really hope these videos are helping you. Subscribe to my channel, like this video, and check out my previous videos in the past. Remember to check out Competency 1 and the GKE reading resources. All links will be down in the description. If you're taking the ESE exam soon as well, I have a video on those as well. So please go ahead, look through my videos that I already posted, see which one you need to watch, and I will see you in the next one. Thank you. Take care.